Father, I pray that the words that I speak today will bring life and light into the hearts of those who hear it. May our hearts be just uh, turned over and fertilized and watered today uh, to the things that you have to say. May our our lives be enriched, open our minds uh, to the things that uh, we hear. And uh, as we as we listen intently um, to what we're even telling ourselves as we hear uh, these words, may it give us some insights to where we are and the condition of our own hearts. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we are on the tail end of this series called Renovation of the Heart. And what we're talking about is the heart and its need to be reformed or renovated or transformed and so uh, last week we talked about and we painted a picture of the uh, what a ruined heart looks like that is a heart and a life that is continuously being formed and lived separate and apart uh, from God and we painted we painted a picture of that and it reminds me of the words that uh, the apostle Paul said when he said that when we sow to the flesh it reaps destruction he wasn't talking about after you die either he was talking about in the here and now and you see the destruction all around us and so and it's good for us to understand this it's good for us to see this not just for ourselves but so that we could help out other people as well now today we're going to continue to talk about the heart and the, the idea of how the heart needs to be transformed specifically what I want to talk about today is what it takes and then if we have time, we'll, we'll kind of paint uh, maybe just some basic shifts that will happen, some things that we'll experience, some things that we'll see when our hearts, when we start seeing our hearts be transformed or really being restored to the way that they're intended to be. Uh, rising up from out of the ruins, what that is going to look like. Now, in order for this to happen, in order for our hearts to be transformed, every aspect of our lives has to be reordered, reprioritized, has to be shifted, has to be changed. Every aspect of our lives has to be reordered under God. Remember when we talked about the makeup, what, what, what it means to be human, the various aspects of our lives, how we all have thoughts, we all have feelings, we all have desires, we all have a will or the heart of the spirit. We all have a, a body through which we, we live. We all have a social context in which we live. And then when you take all these various aspects aspects and put them together that's what makes up the soul now the problem is is when our hearts are being formed away from God when it's continuously being lived and formed away from God the dominant force or the dominant aspect of our life ends up being the body or how oh, scripture says it the flesh and then everything underneath it li actually lives and thrives to serve the body or the flesh Paul says it's this way. It's like the mind being set on the flesh as opposed to on the spirit or on God. And so our goal and the goal here of a transformed heart is to take all these various aspects of our lives and reorder them and reform them to where they're living under God. And reality is our hearts are there to serve God and our life flows down through God and to us. And the very last aspect, the, the, least, the, least, the least thing in our lives that we're concerned with the least thing that has the thing that has the least power over us ends up being the body or the flesh. Everything else is there to serve the heart or to serve God. Those things have to be re reordered. We have to reprioritize the way we live. And if our minds and our and our hearts and our feelings and our thoughts and our social context and our soul is simply there to serve the body. We're living a life and we're forming our hearts away from God. And actually we're conforming to the world instead of being transformed by the renewing or the renovating of our minds. And so in order for our hearts to be transformed, we have to, pre, we have to reorder all these various aspects of our lives. And it's only then that transformation to take place. Now, in order for that to happen, if we're really going to reorder every aspect of our life, who we are, our makeup, our thoughts, our feelings, our hearts, our, our bodies, our social context. Our so if we're going to reorder all of that, it's going to take one thing. And that one thing is complete and total submission to God. Complete and total submission to God. So what, what does that mean? What do we mean by complete and total submission to God? It's when we abandon ourselves and devote all of our energy to serving him with everything we have. When we're told to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength, and love our neighbor as ourself, that includes every aspect of who we are. And if we're going to properly do that, if it's going to become a natural course of who we are in our lives, 
being sanctified, being saints. We have to reorder all of these things and it's going to take complete and total submission, complete and total submission to God. Now, our submission has to go beyond just a verbal submission. It has to take into a submission of the mind. Submission of the mind to being renewed. We have to desire that. That's why I ask all the time, is this what we really want? Consider what, what Paul says in Romans 12 too. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And then Paul goes on to say in Ephesians chapter four, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful, deceitful desires and be renewed in the spirit of your minds. It's all about yielding ourselves to God in such a way that we can say it is no longer I, but Christ who lives in me. And that will not be just the favorite passage that we memorized or a quote that we hear or something that just sounds good to become a reality in our own lives. Now, Jesus used, and the scripture uses several different phrases and words to describe this process of the mind being renewed and what it takes to give into total, complete submission to God. That's a, that's, if I say that, what goes through your mind? Complete and total submission to God. Some people may be thinking, I do that. Some people may be honest with themselves and think, man, there's some per aspects of my life where that sounds, that sounds hard. It sounds uncomfortable. In fact, it sounds a little bit painful. And it, some people have this idea of what that actually looks like, which causes them to run completely in the opposite direction. We're not saying you need to become an aesthetic or a monk. But what does this look like? What does this mean? Well, Jesus paints pictures for us to try to help us in our context to understand this. And so let's go through really quickly some of these phrases that describe this process. You have the phrase of self-denial or death to self. What is that? We hear it all the time, right? Jesus says, you have to die to yourself. What does that mean? Well, it's an overall condition of life. It's an overall condition of life where we settle under the rule of the authority of another. In this case, under the rule and authority of God. It literally, it is like you walking up to God and you're taking this crown off of your head and you understand what this crown means and you understand the power behind this crown. You understand the authority behind this crown, at least what you think it is. And you are willingly submitting in that moment, every aspect of your life, all of your makeup, your thoughts, your feelings, your heart, your body, your social context, your soul, all of this, you are submitting in this moment to him. And so you bow, taking this crown off and you put it onto the head of another. This is total and complete submission. This is dying to self. You have the power to live your life the way you want to. Unfortunately, when we live our lives just the way that we want to, and when the way that we want to is separate from God, we really have no control. At the end of the day, what we end up learning is that we're not in control. There is something much bigger and deeper and inside of us that is controlling us. And oftentimes, what's controlling us is the flesh. But in this moment, she says, you have to die to yourself. There's this self-denial that must take place. That's why he says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 39, it's all about leaving the life the way you want it, separate from God and exchanging it in favor of a life that God has designed. Notice what Jesus says. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Think about that. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You typically don't purposely lose something, do you? We typically don't purposely lose something. That's why we get angry and upset when we can't find something, right? You wonder, where did your wife put this, right? And she's wondering, I had nothing to do with it. I've never seen it before. Right? Or you blame your children. Or you blame the dog. Right? You never purposely lose anything. That's why we project that blame onto everybody else. Jesus is talking about us being intentional and purposely denying ourselves, self-denying, dying ourselves, submitting ourselves to the will of another. 
we're purposely reordering our life in favor of the life that God has to give us. That's self-denial. Jesus also uses these words in Luke 14 about taking up the cross. But notice what he says as he builds up to this place in verse 26. You've got to pay attention to this. There's a lots of claims that we make. Sometimes those claims we make are claims because we want to have the right answer. Because we know what the right answer should be. But that really doesn't dictate who we are. And so there's just this little facade that we put up. And we just assume and lie to ourselves and fool ourselves that this is who we are. But notice the words of Jesus. And I want you to really, you need to grasp, grasp the, the brevity of, 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 of what this was. And the gravity of what it would have had on the hearts of those who heard him. Notice, he doesn't go into much detail. <laughs> Luke says it this way. If you come to me and do not prefer me over your own father, mother, wife, children, brothers and sisters, and yes, even your very own life, you cannot be my disciple. See, we can claim all day long who we are. But the reality is, Jesus says, if we do not desire him over all these other things, even, yes, even our own lives, the reality is you're really not a disciple. What? Why would Jesus say this? What's the point of this? Why would he even begin this conversation this way? And then he paints this very shocking image of a person carrying wood or lumber on his own back that represents the very thing that he is going to die on, a cross. And he says this, and if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. If you don't care for me more, desire me more, then the people's, even your own self, is most valuable to you. You can't be my disciple. And if you're not willing to carry a cross, what does the cross mean? And, and we have all sorts of explanation of what this cross is, and we think it's burdens and so forth. Simply, what Jesus is saying is the very same thing that he said earlier. The cross represents what? Death, annihilation. And in this context, death to self, it's talking about a self-denial. You're losing your life to do what? To find it. Jesus says, listen, if you do not, or if you're not willing to deny yourself, to lose your life, to exchange your life in favor of the one that I'm here to present to you, you cannot be my disciple. It's the same teaching that he just previously taught that we referred to, self-denial. He says, you cannot be my disciple. Why? I don't understand this. Jesus says, it's not until you're willing to let go of who you are in your life. Literally die to yourself. Exchange your life for a greater one. Where your will does not have to be done. Where your will is not the most important thing. Unless you're willing to do that. And until you're willing to do that, you're not going to be able to understand the things that I teach you. You're not going to be able to see the reality of how these things can exist in the real life that you can't actually live in the here and now. And in fact, many of the teachings that I, that I profess to you will seem like they're impossible or extreme. And it's not until you, un, you actually lay down your life that you begin to understand these things and see, see the wisdom in these things. And the more and more you do this, the more and more you will learn and come to understand the reality of what I say. But until then, until then, guys, we're known different than well, many of the religious leaders. Well, we were blind leaders of the blind, professing to understand something, professing to live something, and we're sitting here trying to sell something to other people that we ourselves don't experience. And that's why Jesus says, before you do this, notice what he, notice what he says in verse 28. That's why he goes on to say, don't begin until you count the cost. Do you really understand what real submission, what that really means? See, now, when we talk about counting the cost, though, what do we do? What do we think about? Inevitably, 
ultimately, I think the, the first thing and maybe the only thing we t- typically think about are the negative ideas, the negative aspects of counting the cost, right? It's going to be hard. It's going to be tough. It's going to be uncomfortable. It might be painful. And all those things are true. But here's the deal. To truly count the cost, not only do you have to look at the negative side of things, you also have to look at the positive side of things. What is it that you're going to actually gain by giving up your own life, by self-denial, by complete and total submission when you take all of your energies and you put them towards serving God in every aspect of your life? So we typically think about all the negative stuff. But here's the thing. When you start thinking about all the positive things, here, here, here it is. It always outweighs the negative. When you think about the life you're leaving behind and the life that you're going to actually gain in the here and now as well, when you think about that, when you think about what you actually gain by submitting everything, every aspect of you, by reordering all of it under God, you really won't feel like you're depriving yourself of anything. See, oftentimes... We don't do the hard stuff or we don't go in a certain direction because we feel like we're going to be deprived. What do I have to give up is what we think about. But I'm saying we need to be thinking about what exactly are we going to gain because we're gaining something because we're giving something up. Jesus said a parable. He talked about a parable about this, right? The kingdom of heaven is like a man who saw a treasure in a field and he sold everything that he had to acquire that treasure. You think he felt deprived because of all the things that he sold? No, because he knew he was gaining something so much greater. If you found a piece of land that was soaking with oil or gas or minerals or whatever else you guys make money off over here in Texas, and nobody else knew about it, and you began to sit down and count the cost of what it's going to take to acquire that piece of land, and you come to understand that you're going to have to get rid of everything that you have, but you see the prize is so much greater. You sell everything you have, you're not going to feel deprived because you know what you're obtaining is something so much greater. That's what Jesus is saying here. You have to count the cost. And when you count the cost, when you think, when you, when you see exactly what you're going to actually gain by giving up some things, you don't feel like you're being deprived. And what you're actually going to gain is a life that is lived from a heart that is restored from a heart that is transformed, where the teachings of Jesus don't seem like they're far out and left field or extreme or impossible, but actually can and will become a reality. So I want to paint just for a few moments a picture of what we actually gain. And this is just a small little picture. And I think we know what these pictures are because we read them, right? We read them in Scripture, We've seen people maybe in our lives who we've seen it lived out through them. Their expressions, their demeanor, their responses in life, just the way that they live, the way they handle themselves. And so we know it's true. We know it can be reality. And we know this is the thing that God is calling us to. But why isn't it a reality in my life? Well, today, just for a few moments, I want to talk about that. What is this picture? What are some basic shifts that we're going to see in our lives, potentially, as we continue this journey towards our hearts being transformed and reality being restored to the way that they should be. What will we experience? A life restored. Well, the first thing that comes to my mind is the joy that James talks about. James chapter one has always been a favorite section of scripture of mine because for so long I didn't understand it. And then I began to understand it and couldn't understand why I couldn't feel it, why I could not experience life that way. And I still struggle with it because it is a hard thing and it is a hard teaching. But notice what he says in James chapter one, verse two. He says this, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith produces all works, patience or endurance of perseverance. And then he says this, and let patience have its perfect work. Why? So that you might be complete, lacking nothing. First of all, getting past, getting past the idea that when hardships come our way, it's an opportunity for great joy. 
Usually it's like, okay, this guy's off his rocker. Let's read something else. How is that even possible? What? He says, well, well, you got to understand. Look at what you're gaining. This is what's going to happen. Your faith is going to be tested. You are being tried. You are being molded. You are being shaped. You remain faithful. Let patience have its perfect work that you may be complete, lacking in nothing. Well, what does that even look like? How can I be complete, lacking in nothing? Well, in this context, it's the idea of being able to accept what life throws your way, whether it's hardship, injustice, cruelty, contempt. We handle it all with patience. How do you handle it without, with patience? Without murmuring or complaining. Usually, if something is testing me, my patience is being tried, there are some words being spoken. I'm complaining. I'm murmuring. There's something being stirred up going on inside of me. And when I think about getting to a place where regardless of what the world throws at me, that I can, I can look at that and I can see it coming, number one. But number two, it can bring a smile to my face, fill me with joy, knowing that I am going to be tried and tested through this, and I'm going to come out on the, on the opposite side a better person, a different person. And I want God to have his work, and so I'm going to, I'm going to let him work on me, and I'm going to endure faithfully, even if I don't know what to say, even if I don't know how to respond, and even if I respond and say the wrong thing, I'm going to get back up and still look towards him and be faithful, knowing, knowing that at some point, by enduring these things, my heart will be formed in such a place where I can endure this with patience, true patience, real patience, and joy. It's a life where, when I read scripture, it's a life where giving or forgiving, we won't look at these ideas from the perspective of us giving up something. You ever think about giving or forgiving? I think sometimes we, we look at that and we have such a difficult time with that because we feel like we're actually having to give up something. We're having to sacrifice something. We're being deprived of some things. Well, I look at the words that are quoted in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, Jesus is quoted as saying this, it is more blessed to give than receive. And I'm like, okay, how is that? Is it because you're being, I, I'm allowing you to give me something, right? And so since I'm allowing you to give me something, you'll be blessed because of that. So give me something or, or how, how does this work actually? Like, it's more blessed to give than receive. What I'm telling you, when we feel like we're being deprived or having to give up on something or sacrifice something, I don't know about you, but it doesn't feel like I'm being more blessed or feeling blessed to give than to receive. Now, some people will say, well, it's because God is going to bless you. For, I'm not denying all that, but I don't think that that's what Jesus is saying here. It's more blessed to give than receive. Well, I think it's simply just simple the fact that more blessed, we're more blessed. We feel we are actually more blessed when we give because we don't feel like we're being deprived of something or having to give up on something. But we want to give because it fills us with joy, because it actually gives us delight. It's a place where we learn to go beyond anger and retaliation and forgiveness, this life restored. You ever wanted to get by beyond that? You ever want to get past the anger and the frustrations and the things that those things kind of stir up within you, retaliation, unwilling to forgive? But here's the thing. When we truly submit, we're talking about dying to self, self-denial. Essentially what we are doing, we are accepting the fact that we do not have to have our way. That's not easy. Get into the place where you actually accept the fact that you don't have to have your way. Sometimes it just seems so far away, doesn't it? You don't have to have your way. Getting to a place where we don't feel like we have to have or we're accepting that removes the burden 
that anger and frustrations. It removes the pressure that unforgiveness and retaliation has on our lives. And it gets us in a place where the words that Paul said ring true in 1 Thessalonians 5.15. See that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. That makes that a reality in our lives. And Peter says in 1 Peter 3, 9, don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people, don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do. And he will bless you for it. But it's also, and this is important, this is, this, is, this is one, I think, one of the major hindrances that keeps us from completely submitting to God and reality. And it also blinds us from really seeing where we are. Don't we want to get to a place where we're able to stand up for what is right without pride and egotism and arrogance? We struggle with that. I think we struggle with that because so oftentimes we confuse the desire for what's right. The reality is it's more of a desire for us having our own way because I'm right. See, I think we confuse the two sometimes. And when we do that, well, think about it. When, it's a, when it's a, there's a situation between right and wrong, passions flare. Right? People, and that's good. People get, are dedicated to their position and what they believe is right. But when it's all about you having your own way or being the one who is right, what it typically has a tendency to stir up is, 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 is agitation and anger and frustration and irritability, contempt, where actual truth has less power. And it's more about me coming out on top. Think about it. Have you ever been in an argument where you thought for sure you had the right position? Someone proved you wrong and you knew it subconsciously. You knew you were wrong, but you continue to argue for the same position, even though you knew you were wrong. Have you ever done that? You can be honest. It's okay. I've done it. I'll be honest. I've done it. Be honest. I'm telling you, you gotta be honest. You ever done that with your spouse? You knew you were wrong, but you do everything you can to come out on top. See, it's less about the truth and more about you being right. And more about you having your way as opposed to the truth. How do we rise above that? Well, when we lay down the idea, we accept the notion, the reality that we don't have to have our own way. It removes that burden and actually allows us to rise up from situations like this. That's what it takes. Complete and total submission where all of our energy goes into serving God in everything that we do. At work, at home, in relationships, while we're driving down the road, any human contact we have, what we do in private, what we do on the phone, and every aspect of our lives and our thoughts and our feelings. See, when we lay down this burden of actually having to have our way, we can begin to truly understand and actually follow the teachings of Jesus. Teachings that lead to a life lived from a restored heart. Is this what we want? Let me pray for you. Father, help us experience a life that's caught up in you, where we are truthful, transparent, honest, helpful, sacrificially loving with joy, where our mind is set on the spirit and we experience life and peace, where we sow into the spirit and reap out of the spirit, an eternal kind of life. Lead us to the place where we no longer desire to live a life where we are promoting ourselves, indulging ourselves, securing ourselves, but live a life where we are walking in the spirit and its fruit is seen all around us, regardless of our circumstances. 
It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.